apologize but I, since I wasn't here for the first three days of the workshop, I don't know if how much of uh, chronic air questions were discussed already. So if I repeat something, I'm sorry. Okay. And let, let me know if I need to skip some. So what are these chronic air coefficients? Well, we have irreducible representations of the symmetric group. They are indexed by partitions of n. And natural operation one can do with uh, these irreducible representations is, of course, taking their tensor product which is again a representation of Sn, and asking how does it decompose into irreducibles. And uh, the multiplicities of the irreducibles are exactly these chronic air coefficients. So they are indexed by three, the three partitions, lambda, mu, and nu. And uh, as it turns out, it's actually there symmetric upon permutation of lambda, mu, and nu. So it, that's why we actually in my talk, um, we are writing them as a, as a sequence. So lambda mu nu, doesn't matter which one is on top. And uh, they also have interpretation in terms of uh, GLN modules, well, GLM and GLM squared modules. And they can be thought of uh, in, th in this language as well, the representations of the general linear group. Uh, and uh, Sometimes they get uh, very of so they get very often confused with the little Wood Richardson coefficients, which are the same, so the, the analogous structure constants, but this time for the, pro uh, the representations of the general linear group. So if we have two irreducible representations of GLN, then they decompose as a direct sum of other irreducible representations of GLN, and the multiplicity is the little Wood Richardson in this case. And uh, so there are various problems related to the chronic air coefficients. One of them is, well, the old 75 or 6 years old problem of finding some kind of combinatorial interpretation for these coefficients. Well, they are, of course, non-negative integers, so they could be counting some kind of combinatorial discrete objects defined by lambda, mu, and, and nu. And the motivation, of course, is that the analogous little Wood Richardson coefficients do have a combinatorial interpretation. In fact, they are counting uh, this so-called little Wood Richardson tableau. And here is an example of what these guys sort of look like. So, yeah, discrete objects. Um, it's actually possible to encode them polynomially in terms of the input and so on, but we'll talk about this later. And just to continue with the connection, so it turns out that for special cases of partitions, the chronic air coefficient is actually equal to uh, little Wood Richardson coefficient. So in these cases, we just thanks to thanks to the combinatorial interpretation for Little Wood Richardson, we also have in this case a combinatorial interpretation for the chronic air coefficients. But of course, if only combinatorics want something more general than that, so that works. And uh, in terms of combinatorics, what is known in terms of this question? Well, so the first results came like 50 years after Murnaghan posed the question. These are special cases when two of the partitions are hooks. Uh, then later we had a, a result when one of the partition is, has two rows or only two parts. But then there are restrictions and there are very serious restrictions on the size of the first size of one of the, the, uh, the size of the first part of one of the other partitions, for example. And uh, if I'm not uh, misinterpreting this result, so when two of the partitions are two rows, there is also an interpretation and maybe the most, the best uh, or the mo most general interpretation is due to John Oblasiak, very recent, when one partition is a hook and 
the other two per partitions can be anything. So this is really what we have so far. As you can see, we're quite limited. <coughs> now, why are we talking about these co co uh, Kronecker coefficients in this workshop to begin with? Well, they also come in geometric complexity theory. So now these are, uh, there are problems about deciding whether the Kronecker coefficient is zero and actually computing it. So here, the, f the, the way that uh, the problems are phrased, we have input our partitions are encoded as sequence of parts. So the size of the input is L log, is on the order of L log n, where n is the maximal uh, part size of these partitions. When the, this is in binary. But actually, you can ask the same questions even if uh, the input was in unary and is uh, more or less the same lack of uh, answer. <laughs> so <coughs> here are the, the conjectures part of uh, GCT. So first is that the decision problem is actually polynomial, whether the Kronecker coefficient is uh, non-zero. And uh, computing the Kronecker coefficient is, well, conjectured to be in sharp p. And uh, so what is the state of the art of these conjectures? Well, first of all, we don't even know whether the decision problem is in NP. Because, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the lack of any kind of combinatorial interpretation. Uh, so of course, there could be some other reason why, how you can decide that the, non, the in this case, the positivity of uh, the Kronecker coefficients. But a combinatorial interpretation possibly would resolve the NP and Sharpie questions. So if they are counting some kind of uh, reasonable combinatorial objects, then yeah, probably they will be uh, in NP and sharp P. But even that is not enough actually to prove that this is polynomial. The decision problem would be polynomial. Um, so of course, the, the analogous question for little Wood Richardson coefficients actually holds. So. Uh, Computing them is in sharp p, and deciding whether they are zero or not is polynomial. But the polynomiality is highly non-trivial result due to uh, due to Knudsen, Knudsen and Tau from like ten years ago. Of course, the combinatorial interpretation easily implied that they are in NP. Actually, fifteen years ago. Fifteen years ago. Okay, yeah. So, um, <laughs> When I first saw the result, it was 10 years ago, I guess you could. <laughs> the counter didn't update. <laughs> ah. Oh, ah. Well, uh, so he has some kind of some result about uh, the fact that it is going to be sharpy hard or um, and in fact, uh, so, yeah. So to, sorry about that, but to compute this whatever this uh, little bit Richardson coefficient, each polynomial time, I just to decide whether it is zero or not. No, sure. Just to decide whether it's zero or not. Otherwise, they're actually yeah, they're pretty pretty big. Yeah. Yeah. So the so decision is polynomial. Otherwise, computing them is definitely. Not. And uh, so what about the Kronecker coefficients? Well, the best, to the best of our no knowledge, they are in gap P, due to Peter Burger, Serenik, and Meyer. And Narayanan, what is he doing here? <laughs> Asking, so he, he, since he proved that little Wood Richardson coefficients are sharp P hard, and since they're special case of Kronecker, then they, they are at least, I mean, there is not, nothing better than that to hope for. Okay. So 
to decide parameter coefficient being zero or non zero is also poly polynomial hard. Now no, I don't no, understand no. this last theorem. That is exact no. computing. Compute them, sure. Yes, to compute them. So there is so there are two problems here. KP is like Kronecker positivity. This so deciding and this cron here is just computing them. So maybe I should I should just have this. This will be showing up. So this is just the decision problem. Conjecture. This is polynomial. And then the Chrome problem is compute those guys. And conjecture is this is in the sharp P class. Yeah, so actually this cron is in gap P. I think there's just a typo. Yeah. Cron is in gap P. Oh I'm sorry, okay. Yeah. Sorry, 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 yeah. So that's what I was wondering that. Oh. Yeah, okay. So We already we know that, yeah. So, so what are the two shopping problems? <coughs> you subtract, right? So, yeah. What are the two problems? You, oh, the the two quantities you see. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. Oh, well, yeah. Oh, right. I'll show a formula, and then you can oh, see why this is true. Yeah. Uh, okay. So <coughs> now that we have, well, now that we know what. Well, know what our objects are to some extent. What are the problems, and what can we really say about them? So, so positivity. This. So first of all, we already have the um, well, merely conjectures ab about uh, deciding positivity. So yes, we are interested in figuring out when is the Kronecker coefficient zero or not, even if we maybe even if we are not actually able to compute it or describe it re very well, maybe there are other ways one can figure this out. And uh, so another motivation of why we, one could ask this question on its own is uh, the following conjecture by Jan Saxo, which is motivated by a similar result when we, have, when we are dealing with representations of finite simple groups of Lie types. Turns out that there is a irreducible character whose tensor squared contains every irreducible representation. And then he naturally conjectured, how about the same question for the uh, symmetric group? Is there a, an irreducible character whose tensor squared <coughs> contains every irreducible representation? And in particular, how, can we prove this for this uh, for the character corresponding to the staircase partition. The staircase partition showing up once again. So this is our guy. And uh, or in other words, showing that the Kronecker coefficient for of this form, rho k, rho k, and nu is greater than zero for all partitions. And, you. and so here is that's a conjecture. The, theor the theorem holds for not the symmetric group, but for finite simple groups. Okay. So it's known when for, for the staircase, but you only have staircase sometimes. Is that what you're saying? No, 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 no. no, no. no it's or not no. It's just a conjecture. It's right. just a conjecture for the staircase. Yeah. Uh, and when was this conjecture? <laughs> Two years ago, or three years ago. Yeah, so this result is also recent, and then, yeah. OK. So here is what we can say about this conjecture. And this, again, result of limited type, but since we don't actually have any good tools to deal with the Kronecker coefficients, that's usually how results look like here. So 
we know that this tensor squared, as in the Saxel conjecture, contains irreducible representations corresponding to partitions that look like that. So we either have hook and some extra boxes here, or we have two rows and some extra boxes here. And the, so for it's a, it's a uh, so these extra boxes are only finitely many. Oh, sorry, sorry. Okay. Because and the reason the reason is that we are doing this by hand in some sense. So there is <laughs> there is so we will show. It's not inherent to the. Yeah, so that's what we could do basically, <laughs> using the method that I'll show in a second. And of course, and uh, the other thing is that if we replace the staircase by some other partition that necessarily has to be self-conjugate, and why should it be self-conjugate? It needs to contain the one column, the sign representation. So if we take this guy, so square minus a box, this is uh, the same results also hold, so it's not... So Presumably people check this conjecture yeah. for some values. Yeah, so the student of Saxel check yeah, this. and. Did they check it? Up to 200 or something? Oh, okay. there's, there's some there evidence. There is, yeah, there is evidence, yes. <laughs> Another question. Um, so but the, the staircase is not the largest representation, the largest yeah. kind of more concave curve. Yes, but, but, we, but the problem with this asymptotic shape is that it's very difficult to kind of handle it or describe it combinatorial. So, so dimension-wise, it's fine. <laughs> the dimension of that one is smaller than the square of the dimension of the staircase. Yeah, but by yeah, no, no. So, so of course, the the square of the dimension of these guys has to be greater than uh, you know. Go <laughs> so, so yeah. so okay. and check this this other one. I guess it's I don't know. They also well. I mean, for every n, you have yeah. different partition, right. but. Yeah, so if you check this one, it's presumably the, this, this one will also work unless you have some issue, I mean, so one should be careful because there are some constraints about the Durfee size, the Durfee square of the two partitions. So if they're um, Durfee squares, the multi multiplied uh, are less than the other, the third partitions, Durfee square, then it's going to be zero, so yeah. yeah, so as long as that holds, then we don't see you have a yeah. uh, sure that group uh, there is like tensor product of those two staircases right it's like by constant theorem. yeah yeah, so actually, I mean it it may not be very relevant to, but this staircase partition. Uh, appeared in my work with uh, Thompson, where we proved that this Hilbert scheme, uh, that the torus fixed points are magnetized by these representations. And this staircase partition has the property that every other fixed point is in its closure. Mm -hmm. So it has a very important property there. And there is also the other thing, as I was going to say, which is not part of our, the staircase shows up in modular representations and also has some meaning in with in with respect to this conjecture. So it's it's not a random partition basically. Yeah, yeah. Like, like the there's the, there's yeah, the Steinberg, Steinberg. Steinberg character, yeah. So that's so Okay. <laughs> so but you need to take a top square. You cannot just take a square? Yes, because the square does not contain. So this does not contain the. This guy here. Oh sure, yes. So, yeah. <laughs> but apart from that, it also contains some many more. Okay, so let me say a little bit how we go about proving whatever we proved. So, here is a statement, which. Uh, it's actually letting us compare Kronecker coefficient to the absolute value of particular character. So the character, this is just the character of the represent, corresponding representation, again, of the symmetric group. And uh, 
what turns out is that if you have like a self-conjugate partition and you take this g nu mu mu, so the multiplicity of nu in the tensor squared, it's actually greater than or equal to the absolute value of the character of this same nu. Evaluated it, these are the principal hooks of our self-conjugate partition. That's all. And the way this proof works is that it go reduce, we reduce to representations of the alternating group. And here is an example. So mu, our self-conjugate partition is this one. These are these principal hooks. And suppose that we take mu, sorry, there is another type, mu to be equal to the same partition. By the Murnagam Nakayama rule, there is only one Murnagam Nakayama tableau we can actually fit inside here. So the character is plus or minus one. And necessarily this guy is greater than zero. So we have that if it's if the partition is self-conjugate, then it the tensor squared contains itself. So this bracket new hat just it's character value. Okay. The character the character evaluation. Yes, just the evaluation. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so of course the character happens to be zero and the character itself is not easy to compute because it's an actually an alternating sum of many things. But uh, so now, now the question is how do we go about computing it? And this is why, why we have the results we have. It's easy to comp it's relatively easy to compute it when we have two rows and hooks and of, I mean the other cases follow anal analogously, but we have more complicated stuff here. Basically, in this case, in these cases, the character is some kind of difference between the number of partitions into parts of sizes these guys. And now, even that's not obviously non-zero. I mean, so it's, if these were all partitions, maybe yes, but so here we also need a result which comes from as the asymptotic analysis of this partition function. This is telling us that these, these guys are actually the number of partitions are strictly increasing from some point on. And then for the small values, then we can still actually do this using whatever is available. So for example, Blasiak's combinatorial interpretation for hooks or uh, uh, the result of uh, Rosa Oriana and uh, Christina Ballantyne about two rows win special cases. What is PA? I forgot. PA, so this is defined as the number oh, here. That's so the that's the definition. Yeah. So maybe just... Nice. Oh, 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 you, you, you don't repeat that. Yeah, you don't, you don't repeat them, so that's. So this is really coming from Murnagan Nakayama rule of uh, how you can fit. So this for so first of all there is Jacobi Trudy hidden in here, and then evaluating a character at just one row is just the number of partitions. So if you have two rows, how you can put the different um, strips into the different. Uh, into the two rows, so this is just again number of part number of ways to create a partition. And okay, so now that we have this uh, comparison between uh, chronicer and characters, in in this case we had that the characters are positive, then we get the result for two rows, hooks, and and uh, the other special cases that I showed. Now, I want to go into combinatorics a little bit. So how does... Uh, so may, maybe I... I'd like to say something. There is another recent result about the uh, Axel conjecture myself that, that tells you the following. This is a general thing 
take uh, the staircase partition row k, row k, and then take a third partition that is, let's say, of the of the form n minus d, and then nu bar. So you have these three partitions, and then you look at the Kronecker coefficient as a function of k, then this is piecewise polynomial. And then you can prove that each of this partition is containing infinitely many tensors rho k, tensors rho k. So this is like as a function of. So, so, so for any fixed d, there is a. Is this how? Yeah. Okay. Anyway. Yeah. Yes. You have this coefficient. And then you look at this coefficient as a function of k, and this function as a function of k is piecewise polynomial. For any fixed d or for any fixed nu bar. Uh -huh. So, so for any fixed bar, you have a sort of polynomial. Okay. So and this infinite interval yeah. in which is polynomial, and it has degree d, which is number here, the subject of this partition, and the, and the principal coefficient is the number of standard geometric law of shape nu bar. So there, there is another and way of trying. The rope, uh, the, the partition. Rope K? Yeah, rope K. Yeah. 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 Okay, let's, uh, <laughs> let's discuss Axel conjecture later. <laughs> so I want to. Uh, talk a little bit about some co more combinatorial techniques or how one can get a handle of these coefficients and some other results that uh, that are more combinatorial in nature. So here is basically a background. I'm assuming that you probably know all this, but uh, in any case, so if you the symmetric functions, if you consider the ring of symmetric functions, then one of the most important uh, representatives of this ring are the sure functions, which are the characters of the reducible GLN representations evaluated at, at the matrix, at the diagonal matrix with these eigenvalues. And uh, so they correspond to the reducible representations and they carry with them the inner product, which is inherent to representation theory. And then we have the vile character formula, which is expressing the sure functions as ratio of two determinants. This is the van der Mond, uh, van der Mond matrix here. So just... Uh, uh, the product of all the pairwise differences. And from one hand, we have this formula. On the other hand, we also have combinatorial interpretation, which is uh, that the sure function is the sum over all semi-standard Young tableau of whatever partition this corresponds to. And then we take the, mo the, the monomial. So we are filling every box with the corresponding variable, and then we just multiply them out for each semi-standard Young tableau. And this is, in this case, for example, what we get if we have three variables. And uh, so then there is, so there is a Kronecker product, which corresponds, comes from the characteristic map on the symmetric group, and this actually corresponds to uh, the irreducible representations of SN. So if we take, you can think of this uh, really informally if we replace the sure functions by the corresponding modules and this star by the tensor product. So this is really what this, uh, what this is. These are the Kronecker coefficient in this case. So if we take uh, this Kronecker product of two sure functions, we get exactly decomposes as sum of sure functions exactly with multiplicities, the Kronecker coefficient. And uh, so the definition of this 
star product. Yes, that's like you can think of it as definition of the star product. So there are also other equivalent ways of defining it. For example, this one. <laughs> and uh, so, so here is one identity which I like to call generalized Cauchy because there is Cauchy identity when you have only two sets of variables. And this is that if you have three sets of variables x, y, and z, and you take all the pairwise products of partitions of the same size, lambda, mu, and nu, and you weight them by the Kronecker coefficient, you just get this product here. So, that's a, so that's a really nice formula. And another way of getting the Kronecker coefficients is, is by this sort of statistic evaluation of one sure function at the pairwise at this x times y where you actually take all the variables are all the possible pairwise products between x's and y's. And when you evaluate this is of course going to be a symmetric function in x and in y. You can expand it in the basis of symmetric functions in, S, in x and y. And you can take, again, coefficient in that expansion in the terms of the sure function. And this is like the more general formula is this one here. So if you have any, you can take inner product of any three symmetric functions. This is what it means. And uh, so, uh, and uh, Another way, so you can you can get the coefficient in front of uh, the in terms if we expand our symmetric functions in terms of sure functions, one way to figure out what the coefficient of the corresponding sure function is going to be is actually using Val's determinantal formula and taking a particular monomial. So if we multiply by the Vandermont our symmetric function, then it's going to split up into distinct monomials like that, the corresponding coefficient for the sure function can be derived as a monomial coefficient in this case. So basically now we, are, we can translate the representation theory in terms of symmetric functions and work with them, maybe because it could be easier, or it, at least it could be easier to get a handle on how things behave. But this should expand. That's a number. It's like the FPGN number. Yes. Yes, and this is this is this is coefficient of this monomial. Oh, I see. I see. Yes. I see. I see. Okay. Sir. Yes. So everything means square. So when we have these square brackets, it's like coefficient in in the whatever expansion makes sense in this case. So let's do a toy example. So now that somebody asked this on math overflow, I can legitimately give this as an example of how one can use this. Uh, so there is a person observed that uh, if, we ta if you take Kronecker coefficient for these three rectangles, so this is m repeated n times l times, this is Lm repeated n times and so on, then this Kronecker coefficient is 1. And asked for a simple reason why this is true. And so here is how one can get this out of sure functions. So remember the platistic interpretation. We have as lambda evaluated at x times y is actually equal to this sum in terms of Kronecker coefficient. So in particular, if you take, if you get whatever sure, uh, whatever you're interested in, you have those sure functions plus something else. And now you can actually specialize and plug in only a limited number of variables in here, and exactly as many that, just from the combinatorial interpretation, just because we have exactly n times l variables and this is a rectangle. Answer this star, right? Wait, wait, sorry. 
What? Yeah, so they, don't you have to sum over mu and nu? No, mu and nu are fixed and, and, and yeah, issues. Yeah, so just... Sum as the first term plus a bunch of other stuff. Yeah, oh, 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 oh. so I can just... So you are ignoring other terms. Right? Yeah, so, so it's just that you know that these other guys are positive. No, no. Okay. Right. So, oh, okay, so now I can limit my, the number of variables here. So x1, x1 to xn, y is y1 to yl. Then this pairwise product has n times l variables. And if you evaluate, if there is only one semi-standard Young tableau of this shape m, m by n times l with n times l variables, so you actually get this guy, which is, of course, the product of these other rectangles, so it's actually equal to the product of these two sure functions. And now, by this comparing with this formula, we get that the Kronecker coefficient has to be 1 in this particular case. And so, and of course, so one can play this, this game anytime you have as many variables as heights, you know, that you already get some kind of call. Okay, so uh, myself a long time ago and follows from from this cryptography. Well, I mean I was just I was just trying to give an example of how the technique works. I'm not claiming any kind of ownership here. It's just I mean, somebody asked this on Matt Overflow here is in his answer. I mean, I'm just trying to uh, show how it could work. So I don't know. It is a <coughs> so okay. So let's talk a little bit about uh, combinatorics further and how these computations can help with other things. Uh, so if we consider partitions that fit inside a rectangle. Their generating function is the Q binomial coefficient. A very nice, easy combinatorial object. And so these numbers, uh, this is just the number of partitions that fit inside a rectangle and has n parts. And uh, so, and it's not so easy to see that these numbers are actually unimodal. So they are weakly increasing up to the middle, the number of partitions, and then weakly decreasing. So one can think of, OK, so there's, there should be some kind of bijection or inclusion and stuff like that. But the truth is that when Sylvester proved this, he was so proud of himself that he wrote this in the <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> a quarter of a century is an old conjecture, too. Yeah. So, but the question now, how did he prove this? So this is another quote from, from his paper. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> well, yeah, so modest, uh, yeah, modest person, what can I say? Uh, <laughs> it's more interesting than <laughs> Actually, yes, because the proof is, just <laughs> I don't know, I never, never had the nerves of going through all the, the details. So, so then there were actually some other proofs. Uh, first, Stanley used the hard left shift theorem. But actually, it's interesting to note that this hard left shift theorem is a simple consequence of SL2 representation theory. Yes. Yeah. So it took 100 years <laughs> yeah. to, to realize that this is connected. Sure. Yeah. Complete the circuit. So. Yeah. <laughs> and we'll complete it once again. So we'll loop around again oh, now yeah. in a second. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah, so there is also linear, simple linear algebra involved, which is more or less um, demystifying this kind of proof and SL2 action. And it, uh, uh, like 24 years ago, Katie O'Hara actually um, 
gave a constructive combinatorial proof which basically interprets these numbers as counting something and being one, the larger one subset of the other. Uh, so now, what do these numbers have to do with anything? So let's take a step back and consider this sort of quantity. So this is a sum over little products of little Wood Richardson coefficient. Well, using this sure function technique, one can actually represent the Kronecker coefficient as difference of two consecutive of these numbers, like k is um, the size of one of the partitions involved. And now just just because these Kronecker coefficients are always non-negative by counting uh, multiplicities of representations, we know that this sequence has to be actually unimodal. That, or in other words, that these numbers are greater than or equal to zero, the difference. And the proof goes through. Uh, goes through, for example, one can do this simply with, again, this symmetric function type computation. Uh, again, taking coefficients and using the so product, the little Wood Richardson coefficients, they, they simply come out from these products of sure functions here. And as I already remarked, the fact that the Kronecker coefficients are non-negative, we have these inequalities. And now, OK, so this is some kind of mysterious sum here. So what does this have to do with partitions in a rectangle? Well, the following. So if we actually take lambda and mu here to be the rectangle, the rectangles themselves, then it's very easy to see that the little Wood Richardson coefficients are just 0 and 1. And in fact, uh, for each partition that fits in the rectangle, we have exactly one partition better for which this is exactly 1. And in this case, this coefficient then is just counting the number of partitions that fit inside the rectangle. And now we get this formula that uh, the Kronecker coefficient for two rectangles and a two row is actually the difference of the consecutive uh, numbers in the Q binomial coefficient expansion or exactly what Sylvester was actually counting. And uh, so this Sylvester's theorem is one corollary, but another Another corollary of, of this fact is actually that one can get bounds on these differences, actually effective bounds on how much larger the next number of partitions is. And so here is an eff effective bound. How is it obtained? Well, it's obtained using two things. First, using the fact that this difference, this, the, this difference is the Kronecker coefficient, and then using this character lemma which I showed earlier that this Kronecker coefficient is greater than or equal to the character. And then we can actually do some asymptotics on this particular character and get these numbers here. And this is not anything that was, so just using pure algebra, that, so that neither Sylvester nor Stanley had actual uh, bounds like that. And of course, if so, this is in the case of uh, uh, in, the, in partitions in a square. And in the more general case, it uses the monotonicity property. Yeah. To Manivel, in uh, that the Kronecker coefficients are actually weakly increasing as long as you are adding partitions so such that this Kronecker is strictly positive. And uh, there is another thing that you can say about this. Now that we actually have some kind of combinatorial interpretation for the Q binomial coefficients other than uh, the partitions, one can actually take the difference between the two things and use O'Hara's combinatorial proof why these numbers are increasing to actually give a 
combinatorial interpretation for the Kronecker coefficients in these particular cases and actual combinatorial interpretation which is manageable in size. Now I'm not going to state it right now here because it's, it's not something very particularly pretty but it is actually explicit and not so big, it's in terms of certain kinds of trees. And uh, of course, the, uh, so this implies that this Kronecker coefficient is going to be in sharp p. And the other case when the Kronecker coefficient is in sharp p that we know, for example, is the corollary of Blasek's combinatorial interpretation where we have a hook. And uh, of course, then the decision problem is also in NP. But still, we don't know anything about whether it's polynomial or not. And uh, so this, is, this brings us to the topic of complexity finally. And I'm sort of running out of time. So I will just state some results here. Uh, so here is an explicit upper bound in the time required to compute Kronecker coefficient in terms of three quantities. So the length of the partitions, their largest part size, and, and the second part of one of the partitions involved. So basically we have partitions with at most uh, with at most L parts and at most uh, the largest part is at most N and uh, and uh, so and here the second the second row of new is let's say bounded by some other parameter M then you can say something like some kind of refined estimate of how long it can take to uh, compute the Kronecker coefficients in terms of this. And in particular, if you get small enough values, then you can actually get a polynomial time algorithm. So as long as you can represent this in polynomial in terms of the input. The what? Second. Second part. So this is like the second row of one of the partitions. But the second row has to be very small. Yeah, well, it, it, if it's on the order of n, then you're not really getting much. But if it's actually small, then maybe you can get some. And uh, of course, we have uh, when m is on the order of n and uh, l is actually fixed, we get the result of Christandel, Doran, and Walter, which probably you guys so earlier this week, then this is actually, you can compute this in polynomial time as long as these exponents are fixed, so partitions of fixed length. But, and here is one other result about this computation, which is that you can actually decide if you have number of parts fixed, you can actually decide the linear time whether the Kronecker coefficient is greater than zero, but, so not just polynomial, but linear, but this is not a real algorithm. So why is it not? Because it relies on the existence of the finite generating set for the semigroup of Kronecker coefficients. So it, the semigroup is finitely generated, so for, for each fixed L. So if you actually know the generators, then yes, so you can, thanks to the results in integer linear programming, you can decide whether this guy belongs to the semigroup or not. And of course. How much time did it take to compute? <laughs> <Well>, <laughs> I was just saying, well, this is like huh? pure, purely, purely, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so the, we don't know the constant, so we don't actually know. It's a, this is a theoretical result, so we don't know that how big is the, uh, how big is the generating set for the semi, semi group, so it's not, we don't even know how to actually find it all, so it's, uh, <laughs> so this is just a, 
theoretical thing. Uh, so it's not an algorithm, it's just a, okay, the statement of what it just. Generating thing, no? And you never want that thing, no? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I, have, I haven't thought about this, so, but I don't, I don't even know how to go about this. <laughs> And uh, so I just mentioned how this, uh, these bounds are obtained. Well, they are relying on, on two, two facts. One is that if you, are if you consider the second part of one of these partitions, and depending on how large it is, you can actually reduce your Kronecker coefficient from computing g lambda mu nu to computing g of partitions which are much smaller, of size that depends on the second parts of n, of new, of one of the partitions. And there are, there are actually explicitly defined these partitions. You are actually subtracting some specific partitions out of them. Big, maybe, probably big. And uh, actually, if you add again this, this uh, semi-group property, the fact that you can go down also means that if you go up too, too much, you are going to get a constant uh, chronic air coefficient. So you can, you can translate this statement also in terms of what's called now more generalized stability. So if you're adding multiples of a partition to two of the part, uh, partitions and a long row, then eventually this stabilizes, so it becomes constant. And this was... Uh, but the last one, you're only adding this box partition. So you're in the last one, you're only adding a long row. Oh, sorry, but the size one. Yeah. Yeah. The sizes need to be. Okay, okay. Uh, and there are actually, I mean, for, in terms of stability, there are actually the state of the art is a paper by Ernesto Vallejo that just came out a few weeks ago, which is, has more general statements than this one. And, okay, so now that somebody asked, asked about sharp uh, gap P, well, there is a way to express this chronic air coefficient as an alternating sum over number of contingency tables, well, contingency arrays, three by, with three-dimensional contingency arrays with certain um, two-dimensional marginals. And of course, if you group the positive and the negative, you get, uh, you get two quantities that are both, the difference of two quantities that are both uh, positive and combinatorially very very nice object, so that's one way to show the gap P result. But also, you can use this formula as, um, again, Christandel, Doran, and Walter did, is actually you can compute the chronic air coefficients by computing the number of contingency tables, and they can be done with Barvinox algorithm in a specific certain um, uh, amount of time. And so, so basically this is con the combination of this and this is telling you just in general how, how easy you can compute the chronic air coefficient. And, uh, and then using the reduction lemma and together with this guy, so once we get from bigger coefficients to smaller coefficients, now we, we just use this this bound, and that's basically what happens here. Uh, and only the last, the last thing is uh, that uh, last result is, if you remember in the beginning there, there was this character lemma bounding chronic air coefficients with characters. Well, unfortunately, maybe this is not the right approach because actually deciding whether the character is zero or not is NP-hard the character deciding whether it's zero or not 
in terms of the two inputs, so partition and conjugacy class, written as, uh, in this form. This is actually MP hard. And <laughs> actually, the very last remark, you said chi lambda mu is MP hard. Deciding if it's zero or not, yeah. Right. No. Is it by the project? I mean, maybe there is some 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 brilliant method to calculate that, and um, it's impossible. So, so the way it's NP hard means by the project methods, are there cannot be any way to assuming p is not equal to NP. So assuming p is not equal to NP, the in special cases of this partition, this character is actually computing it is actually equivalent to solving a knapsack problem. So. That's okay. Yeah, so it's <laughs> that, that at least is a clean <laughs> statement in that, in that part. So um, going back to this, this discussion, so if, if you had an oracle which gave you the character table for uh, your given symmetric group for any size, of course you just said this is NP hard, but doesn't that then tell you that chronic group coefficient is also NP hard because you can just project from, from that problem to your problem? You have a, an the, easy way to go from the character table to computing the Kronecker coefficient. The character table is hard, so. Yeah, so, okay, so does it, it works in one way from, if you have the character table, you can compute the Kronecker, but the problem is. Not conversely, yes. You should be much softer. Yeah, so the Kronecker will be probably something much smaller because it's going to be a, some kind of alternating sum of exactly. these huge characters who, yeah, so it's. So for geometric complexity here, the most interest is around the conifer where two of the partitions are boxes, and the third is very long first part, not too many parts. <laughs> any hope of? Well, so. Uh, you had two, but you had one result where you had box box and something else, but it was the one something else, and then you had another one where it's the right something else, but it wasn't with box box. So, but the other one is you can specialize with the boxes, and in fact, I, we had an email discussion yeah. about this, with the that you can reduce from the oh, the the from the rectangles, you can get to much smaller rectangles, but box box is the worst actually. It looks simplest, but it is the most. Yeah. Can you turn to the slide? <laughs> so, is it conceivable that this is hard also when uh, lambda and mu are very restricted? So, can you redo the proof also if lambda, lambda and mu are not? Lambda, so, this comes from lambda being two rows. Yes. <laughs> or even for lambda that's two rows. Wow. Well,. I mean, it's all. It's already if lambda is two rows, you're already. <laughs> yeah, so so it, it's already pretty bad. Is it NP hard even if you fix them? How is that if you fix them? Well, no. So I think that no. If you fix L, it's not gonna be NP hard. Thank you.